Now, I'm going to introduce to you uh, my very good friend, long-term friend and colleague, Stephen Diane. Stephen's a facial plastic surgeon from Chicago. Uh, and if you have a chance to go to Chicago, he knows all the great bars as well. <laughs> and Stephen is also a very noted author uh, and has written books on the best-selling list. Two of these books I'll mention today. One of them is a book called Subliminal, Subliminally Exposed. And the other book is a book called Thrive. He's also an editor for Modern Aesthetics, and we're very pleased to have him here with us this afternoon, Stephen Diane. Thanks, Robert. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future and what we do every single day and why. And are we clear exactly on what we're doing every single day and why? Because I think we're in a revolution right now. Medicine's changing right before our eyes. And are we ready for it? So let me ask you a question. What is the golden toad, the passenger pigeon, and the woolly mammoth have in common with the Romans, the Huns, and the natives of Easter Island? They're no longer in existence. They are all extinct because they were unable to adapt. It's not the most intellectual of the species, it's not the most strongest of the species, but it's the one that's best able to adapt that survives. If you believe in Charles Darwin, if you believe in evolution, then maybe it's time we take a stronger and closer look at what we are and what we do every single day. Because the future of aesthetic medicine is now, and we need to define it. Because if we don't define our mission, someone else is going to define it for us. And that's what's happening in the U.S. right now. If you look at healthcare in the U.S., physicians have lost in my opinion, the direction of medicine. I think in aesthetics, we still have this opportunity to define what we do. But first, we have to be clear on who we are and what we do. And I'm not so certain we are clear on who we are and what we do. If you talk to the executives at the large corporations and the large think tanks, they will tell us that aesthetics is a highly underpenetrated field. Only 5% of the eligible population is getting aesthetics, and it could grow much more, five times growth. There's potential. And they'll try to tell us all these wonderful ideas to grow the market, to get more patients interested, from new toxins to new fillers to new devices. And that's how we grow the market, according to a lot of executives. But that's assuming that these people who aren't yet getting aesthetic treatments want beauty treatments, that they want their appearance to be better. But I'm going to argue, and I'm going to propose that the market of people, the potential people that we all could be treating is 20 times greater, not just five times greater. If we think bigger. If we think a lot bigger about who we are and what we do. Do we make people beautiful? Is that all we do? We see lots of before and after pictures, lots of perfect noses, perfect faces, perfect bodies. Is that what we do every single day? Or do we make people attractive? And there's a difference between the two, isn't there? Beauty and attraction are very different. But what is attraction? We've never really defined what attraction is. Do we really know? Or have we asked anyone to define what attraction is? Because we spend so much time focusing on techniques, so much time focusing on new products to construct the perfect face. That yes, we know we can do that. Yes, there's a five formula. I can make the perfect face. I can get pretty darn close with every patient. And even if I give them the perfect face and they look a lot better, does that make them attractive? Because attractiveness is something so much more than just the perfect face. Because I know plenty, plenty of beautiful people who are incredibly unhappy and incredibly unattractive. Beauty and attraction are not the same. Because attraction is maybe a selfish act. We like attractive people because it makes us feel good. Attractive people get you excited. When you see something attractive, you get euphoric. You feel good. You're more likely to buy from that person. You're more likely to engage with that person when they are attractive. Not necessarily beautiful, but attractive. And happy people, people who smile, people who are happy, are contagious. If you sit in a room with, with happy people, you become happy. If you're at the airport and there's a bunch of people sitting around a terminal and they start smiling, everyone starts to smile. Conversely, if you're in a room with unhappy people, you start to become unhappy. And this extends to three degrees. Three degrees of people. 
So if you're happy, within three degrees, other people become happy. If you smile, within three degrees, other people smile. This was done, this was done a, this is a cardiology study, which actually found this concept, which I find fascinating to think about that, that if we become happy, people around us become happy. What's interesting is that it doesn't work so well with coworkers. So even if you're happy, coworkers. But with neighbors, it's incredibly powerful, within three degrees. But how does that happen? How do people around us become happy? What's the mechanism? What's the science behind it? And it may all start with something as simple as an expression. An expression alone and a theory. Charles Darwin and William James talked about this concept of the facial feedback hypothesis. You smile and you become happy. You frown and you become angry or sad. It's pretty well established. This is over 100 years ago that they came up with this theory. And today, we pretty much well accept it, that yes, if you smile, you become happy. And if you frown, you become angry. Which is really quite fascinating to think about that. Strack showed that if you put a pencil in your mouth and watch cartoons, you find them funnier. Similarly, if you put two T's on your forehead and we instruct people to frown, they actually feel more negatively about unpleasant sentences or unpleasant photos. So you frown, you become angry, you smile, you become happy. It works. But what's interesting is that this has then linked your autonomic nervous system. And it's only in the most recent history that neuropsychiatry has given us these wonderful imaging studies that we can evaluate what happens with smiles and with frowns. And we can see links in the amygdala, in the limbic system, to the autonomic nervous system to show then the physical manifestations of our frowns and of our smiles. And then these emotions become contagious. They become contagious. You smile, the people around you smile. And this works all at a subconscious level because we all possess mirror neurons. Mirror neurons, they're also in primates. Broadman's area 44 of the brain, you have mirror neurons. It's a game of copycat, like children used to play. Someone smiles, you smile. You don't realize you're smiling, but one of the reasons you do that is because you want to feel what they feel. You want, to, you want to empathize with them. So if you're in a room with someone, you start to smile, and then that smile makes you happy. You start to know what they're feeling. Conversely, if they're upset, you start to get upset. You start to frown. And then you feel what they're feeling. This all happens subconsciously, not at a conscious level. You don't realize it's going on. You mimic their expressions so that you can feel their emotions. It helps us to recognize and understand what they're feeling. And a smile is very contagious. So think about this next time you're treating a patient. Patients are looking in your eyes as you're treating them. If you smile, they start to become happier as you're doing the procedure. I do this all the time with my patients. I think I'm naturally smiling, but maybe I force it a little bit. So while I'm injecting them, they're smiling right back. You're happy, doctor? Yes, I'm very happy. Oh, and it, it sends off this positive cascade where I believe ultimately may even be happier with the outcome. But if you're inhibited, if you don't have that expression, if, you, if you're a blank face, then you don't experience the emotion. And there's no better example of this than autistic children. Autistic children, their, motor, their mirror neurons are inhibited. They don't spontaneously activate. And these children are difficult to feel emotions because they don't pertain these mirror neurons. So how does all this relate to aesthetic medicine and to what we do every single day? How do we equate this neuroscience, this neuropsychiatry with aesthetics and into our clinical space? Because that's really what we want to do. This neuroscience is well established. Our aesthetics and making people beautiful is well established. But how do we bring them together? That's where I live. That's what I want to know. That's what I want to understand because I think that is where the future of our trade is. And today we were able to do double-blind placebo randomized control trials. Plastic surgery, aesthetic medicine was in the dark ages for years because we could not do studies. There was no such thing as a double-blind, placebo-randomized controlled trial in aesthetics. You couldn't have evidence-based medicine because everyone knew if they had something done when we did surgery on patients. You couldn't have it before and afterwards. Did I have a facelift? Did I not have a facelift? It was impossible. But now, today, with neurotoxins and fillers, we're able to, to construct and design double-blind, placebo-randomized controlled trials to better understand what we're doing. And yes, we know that after giving a neurotoxin, there is slower recognition, slower reading comprehension, and slower cognition of negative sentences. We slow down when we read these sentences. We don't perceive 
negativity as easily if we have neurotoxin placed into our corrugators. It doesn't happen if we read happy sentences. Only when we read negative sentences. So we can't perceive negativity as much. And this got linked to the amygdala, which shows that when neurotoxin is placed into the corrugator muscles, there's an uncoupling effect in the amygdala. It's decreased signaling. There's attenuation of the signals in the amygdala that then connect with the autonomic nervous system. So yes, we can see that through the facial feedback hypothesis that we can control how our brain perceives negativity, which is really fascinating because in essence, we can uncouple. We can uncouple this aspect. We can reduce expression leading to the mood. So can we use our treatments to affect mood? And yes, there's well-established trials now that major depression, which affects 16.2% lifetime prevalence, risk morbidity and mortality of quality of life is terrible with depression, right? 33% reach remission, but 33% of people who have major depression may not reach remission despite multiple drug trials. Depressive symptoms in 44% of the elderly. Depression is very prevalent. And the medications we have today for depression have side effects that can be quite significant. Antidepressants, in 1987, Prozac was introduced, and since then, the floodgates have been opened. Depression is very commonly prescribed, uh, diagnosed in the U.S. now. Antidepressants are the second most common prescribed drug in the U.S. More than 10% of Americans now take antidepressants, which is really unbelievable to think about. 10% of our population takes it. It's an $11 billion drug industry. Is there a superior alternative? Can aesthetics be used? Can aesthetics be quantified, qualified, and dosed to treat mood? Can we quantify, qualify, and dose aesthetics to treat mood? Botulinum toxin has been shown in studies to improve self-esteem and quality of life. It's also been shown effectively to treat depression. Well-designed trials to show it's able to treat depression. Hamilton D scores reduced when Wolmer looked at it. 47%. He also showed a partial response rate, 86 to 26% versus placebo. He had a remission rate of 33%. That is similar to drugs, to the antidepressants we're giving people. So we're getting the same type of results as we are with every single day oral medications. These benefits have been corroborated by Finzi and by Doris Hexel, who did a wonderful paper to show that yes, you can reduce depressive symptoms in patients who have major depression quite significantly using neurotoxins. Advantages of using a neurotoxin to treat mood disorders, excellent safety record, three months from one dose, so compliance should go up, and compliance is always a difficult situation with antidepressants, and few drug interactions. But here's the leap of faith I want to take, because yes, we can deduce, and we can show that neuromodulators can treat mood disorders. We now have clinical trials proving that, but let's take it one step further. Beyond neuromodulators, how about fillers? Can fillers be used? to induce a smile? If I show you this picture and this picture and I ask you who's happier, just from this one little picture, I ask you which patient's happier, can you tell just from looking at her face, from her smile? Look at her corner of her mouth. A one millimeter change in the corner of the mouth makes a person look like they're smiling. They make them look a little bit happier. Is she really happier? I don't know, she certainly looks a little bit happier, but no one's ever studied it. I went back and looked at my facelift pictures. Do facelift patients smile more afterwards, or do they look like they're smiling afterwards? Are they actually happier? They tell me they're happier, but are they actually smiling afterwards? They certainly look like it in a lot of post-operative photographs when I started looking closer at them. How about makeup? Recent studies that I've done with makeup have shown, yes, makeup as well can affect mood. Makeup can improve the first impression people have. It also improves their feelings, their mood, and their quality of life. Nutraceuticals, oral supplements as well, has been shown to improve people's appearance. Hair supplements have also been shown to improve self-esteem. So it's not just neurotoxin. Now we're looking at fillers. Now we're looking at surgery. Nutraceuticals, makeup, all these things can effectively treat mood. But how? How are they all treating mood? Well, maybe we look in the mirror and we feel good about ourselves. We're happy with what we see. Maybe others look at us and they smile, so we start to smile. Or maybe it's that we really can't form a frown anymore. And if we can't form a frown anymore, we become happy. Maybe that's what it is. If you have a positive expression, if you smile over and over and over again, there's evidence that shows to improve quality of life. 
Women who smile, we want to engage with them more often. And it's even shown to be correlated to better life marriages. Better quality of life in your marriage if you smile. So smiling people have been shown to have an improved quality of life and a better life just from smiling. So what's our mission in aesthetic medicine? I think it's so much deeper and more meaningful than just making people beautiful. And it's time for us to evolve. It's time for us to go to the next level to define our mission. Because conventional wisdom paints us as purveyors of beauty for the vanity challenge. That's how we're perceived outside this room. You go to the general public and they think all we care about is making people beautiful. They think everyone who has a treatment, you can tell. But our skills are so much more than just treating form and function. They're also for improving mind and mood as well. And our message, I think, should be more than that we chase wrinkles and folds on middle-aged women. But that through surgical and non-surgical treatments, aesthetics enhances mood and self-esteem. It's not just form and function. Mood and self-esteem. The future in aesthetics is not to make people look beautiful, but to feel beautiful. And there's a difference between looking beautiful and feeling beautiful. They're related, but if our mission and our outcomes become to make people feel beautiful, that's a message of empowerment, not a message of vanity. And that is a limitless market that's 20 times greater than what we're treating now. Are we ready for that? Thank you very much. Thank you.